How do you compromise when you and your partner have completely different sex drives? Managing in-law relationships and family dynamics. Is it impossible for some women to orgasm with penetration? How to handle bad communication in early dating stages. <laughs> I'm here with my mother <laughs> um definitely a channel favorite as well as being my mom this is tamar ben hoor psychotherapist specializing in couple therapy you guys sent in so many questions on instagram but we're trying to get through as many in kind of different categories a lot of people ask the same questions so hopefully we cover lots of ground yeah and we're going to be talking about love relationships breakups in-laws in we have a lot of in-laws we had so many yeah. people asking for advice on in-laws it's very very important to remember you know we're not aware of your context yeah use whatever is useful whatever is not chuck away and this is obviously not a substitute to doing personal individual counseling first question how to know when to leave a relationship we kind of talked about this in our like last video we did ages ago like mm -hmm. on breakups and stuff mm -hmm. um but i remember even in that video you gave such good advice so i was like i think we should answer this question because yeah. i've been there where you're like fuck like i don't know like there's still love there or it feels still good in so many ways but there's also that little voice inside your head that's like maybe there's something wrong like do i right. stick it out do i leave yeah and and in that ambivalent place where a part of me wants to stay and is so comfortable and is mm -hmm. so familiar and Safe. loves so many things about the relationship and then a part of me wants to go and possibly explore something else or explore yourself in a yeah. different context you know sometimes it's less about the other person and it's more about who you have become with the other person yeah so i think um it's really also very context related uh, it's very very different to ask this question uh, after being married for five years and having a two-year-old baby mm -hmm. then when you've been together for three four years you know and, and this is your first relationship yeah. um, so sometimes you do need to put more effort in actually growing within the relationship and not discarding the relationship prematurely or being too rushed with that decision yeah um but sometimes it's also a, a very relevant question and there is a part of that that you do need to listen to mm -hmm. am i still growing in this relationship um, has this relationship somehow concluded what it's uh, what is kind of uh, yeah. has, has meant to, to conclude. I think sometimes it's hardest when there's so much love. Mm. Uh, you know, sometimes it's very clear, you know, this is uh, abusive or, or unhealthy and that's yeah. kind of a no-brainer in a way. But then when there's so much love and comfort and attachment, then I think that's when it becomes more complicated and obviously mm. there's not a one size fits all. That advice of just asking yourself like, do I still like who I am in this relationship? Like how this relationship makes me feel is such a good indication and way to kind of connect with that gut feeling, I think. Yes. And that's at the end of the day when you have to make these decisions, uh, that's all you can often really go off. So hard to listen to sometimes. Yes. How do you compromise when you and your partner have completely different sex drives? Okay, so this is juicy, uh, juicy, <laughs> and it is also probably the most common dynamic mm. uh, between partners. It's it's like almost like unbelievable how we somehow choose unconsciously to <laughs> <a> mismatch. <laughs> You know, I've, I've worked with so many couples and um, it is rare to see a couple that is absolutely a match in mm. terms of the, their needs. And it's not only for intimacy, it's also sometimes emotional needs. You yeah. know, so one partner wants more, one partner wants less. Um, so I definitely think it's, it's a very relevant question and it's something that most couples are dealing with. Firstly, talking about it is a great asset for for any relationship i definitely think 
the one with less desire is the one to set the pace mm. uh, because uh, we do need to have consent if you're not able to bring yourself to that place then that would actually be harmful but saying that i also think there are different doorways to enter uh, desire yeah and i think we're culturally very programmed to see desire as something that has to be spontaneous come out of the blue you know it's kind of completely sweep me over mm. and, and and that's not always the case i think for many of us uh, we don't necessarily access spontaneous desire, but we can access uh, what we call responsive desire. Mm. So it actually means that you put yourself in a context where your psyche and your body, rather than say, yes, I want this, it would say, hmm, why not? I'm willing to try. Mm. And then once that's associated with something pleasurable, then it could say, hmm, maybe I'll have a little bit more of that. Mm. So I think in, in the, the partner that has less, kind of a lower access to spontaneous desire, in a way, it's their responsibility to create the right context and mm. to create the right environment for more of that, well, maybe, why not? Completely. That is such good advice. I feel like also it's worth mentioning with that because it is such a common thing. I think what's so tricky about it is that there can be a lot of shame attached mm. on both sides of like maybe not feeling wanted and desired by your partner yes. and then the other partner maybe feeling like you're not fulfilling or satisfying your partner's needs and I think that's what sometimes stops those conversations just because your partner might not have desire in the same way doesn't always mean they don't have feel, desire yeah exactly. and feel like just as deeply about you as you them how do you accept coming from an abusive relationship to a healthy one mm. yeah that's um, a very very good question and you know I think we all carry our histories um, whether it's trauma uh, whether we have a background of uh, abuse and it, it's a heavy burden to carry mm. and it's like a heavy dowry to bring into a relationship mm. but I think the question itself is spot-on because it really makes you wonder you know what is it that's happening to me that is connected to my past and mm. what is actually happening to me that's connected to the present moment and often when we have histories of abuse um, different elements in our environment can show up as triggers mm -hmm. and for the that part of the brain it doesn't know how to distinguish between what happened then and what's happening now. So just actually having that question is very, very valuable. Mm -hmm. uh, tracking, you know, oh, this was a trigger for me. I'd also say that this is exactly the point where it would be really helpful to access um, some form of counseling around uh, what has happened in the past and how can you actually uh, make sense of that mm. make sure that um, you know what's happening in in the present moment is not a repeat because sometimes we do have warning signs mm. uh, of, of we're actually that we're not meant to ignore so really learning how to distinguish between these two I think it's um, there's a bit more of deeper work that needs to be done it's a very very good question and you're in a very good place um, to be asking that question. So don't don't shy away from it. How to let yourself be in your feminine more? Okay, I guess the question is really, you know, how do you see the feminine mm -hmm. and the feminine element or feminine aspect uh, exists in women and in men. So mm. I think it's a really good question. I'd say that I see the feminine as being what we would consider more receptive 
um, more um, cyclical rather than linear, cultivating the energy of receiving rather than providing. It's really um, a challenge often to allow ourselves to be in that place of receiving. What does it mean to you uh, to receive? Um, what are the obstacles um, that you can actually maybe remove from your environment to make it easier for you to receive? I definitely think it's a worthy exploration mm. because we do want this balance in, in each and every one of ourselves where we do actually have access to the depth and the wealth of, uh, of the feminine. I guess it's asking yourself also, can you find in your life role models for, yeah. for healthy feminine? Often the feminine is associated with, you know, because it's associated with receiving, it's like this huge, um, you know, everything can just come in. So the only way we know to protect ourselves is actually to shut that door and then you're not actually allowing yourself to mm -hmm. be in that receptive feminine place. Oh, yeah. So I guess, I think for, for, for us, it's really cultivating how can I have such clear, safe boundaries that I am actually very feeling very, very safe to have my heart really open and be very receptive. One of the books that I, I think is absolutely a Bible, written by a Jungian psychoanalyst, uh, Clarissa Pinkella, uh, Pinkola Estes, uh, it, it's called Women Who Run With Wolves. And I absolutely um, recommend that book for everyone. Literally, it's been on my list for so long. It's embarrassing. I haven't read it yet. <laughs> <laughs> it's all coming at the right It'll time. It'll come, yeah. yeah. How to find dating fun and not always outcome-based. Yeah, I mean, fair enough. It's <laughs> so hard to be dating and putting yourself mm. out there. And obviously, you know, you do have that yearning for an outcome. Accepting that it is challenging. But I'd say uh, maybe a shift in perspective can be helpful and sometimes it can be helpful to maybe see the, the, the meetings as maybe has even a little bit of a spiritual element to it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's souls that are you're, you're, you're crossing pathways and sometimes maybe if it's not, not, not the ultimate uh, outcome of it being the one um, there is a gift there there is some kind of exchange mm -hmm. there there's some kind of uh, teaching that can happen there there is some kind of uh, gifts that we're giving each other in those moments it's like finding the beauty and like the fact that you do just cross paths with someone and it might not be like the fact that you like start parallel living lives together but right. these like crosses are really beautiful and also we get to know ourselves through others as well and getting to meet different facets of yourself and different versions of yourself and like really tapping into like how does this person make me feel and like using it almost as like a practice in a way and a tool to like get to know yourself better because i personally really struggle with this being just such a romantic of like just like being like oh just meeting people with no expectation but so many of my friends are always like reminding me just like it's so fun to just like meet someone mm -hmm. and it's there's no pressure attached especially with dating that's the thing it's like you can meet someone for coffee or a dinner or a walk and it's like we're just these two people that just get to like get to know each other and like mm -hmm. sometimes there's a click sometimes there's not but you yeah. still got to like cross paths with this person and usually come out of it with some sort of like learning about what you like or don't like or how you behave and how you you know like it's not that deep I think <laughs> that's what I tell myself it's not that deep what to do to get out of a rut I know what I have to do but I'm frozen and anxious yeah okay I think you know frozen and anxious are expressions of where the nervous system's at mm. it does sound like a trauma response uh, because we do respond to trauma in the way of fight flight freeze mm. so the freeze is actually a nervous our nervous system basically saying we got so overwhelmed um, there was a level of shock there 
that is kind of a little bit of a beyond our capacity to integrate. Mm. So what I would say is um, you're right that you're not actually able to move past this just through knowing what to do. It's not a question of discipline. Um, and uh, the key is also in what you were saying, you know, if you're finding yourself in a place where you're frozen, the focus needs to be on movement. You know, what is the smallest movement that I can start to incorporate? And remember, not you don't need to kind of put yourself already beyond this, but just start very, very small mm. movement, any kind of movement, you know, sometimes for people is, you know, can I just move my little finger? You know, that's already movement. Or can I just move my body somehow? Mm. Can I do walking or or anything that would incorporate gentle movement and start to to generate that information for the nervous system I'd also say that that's a place where um, you know very often it, it is helpful not to do this on your own you know try to to understand what's the circle of support you have around you, you know, really even drawing a, a little circle and, and putting the closest people to you in the inner circle. And then, you know, maybe a few people that are, are close, but in the outer circle after that, and um, creating a little bit of support around what, what you're experiencing at the moment, not expecting yourself to do it alone. Mm -hmm. And also, you know, counseling is, 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 can be very, very helpful to actually understand what, what is your nervous system responding to. We definitely could all be kinder and more gentle to ourselves, especially in the world we live in. It's really pushing us to go, 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 hustle. That doesn't really give us time to kind of rest and um, process a lot of the time so it's like we can often go into the extremes of complete shutdown exactly because that's the only way that our body gets to stop and, and yeah, start they, integrate yeah. yeah and I think like also like uh, in those moments it's so easy to go into self-hatred of like I know what I need to do why can't I fucking do a simple thing right. right now but to just really give yourself that kindness and love like everyone has gone through this or will go through this at some point like being human is hard and in those moments like it is so important to be kind to yourself it's not a personal failure yeah and, and it will pass even though it's really hard like you will get through it like you are strong all right next question how do you get over the fear of being seen by a partner when you're self-conscious i think that many people experience that and we all we we all have this a little bit of a sense like there is this kind of camera on us and mm. we, we're being watched from the outside and i guess that is very normal so whatever you can do in your environment to ease that you know sometimes this is like dimming the lights or, or creating warmth or whatever you need to do in order to actually help yourself uh, feel more comfortable mm -hmm. but I guess in terms of where you want to take your mind is to move from looking at yourself from the outside to mm -hmm. actually locating yourself inside yourself and asking yourself how am I feeling rather than how do I look mm -hmm. how do things feel rather than they look and it's almost like a new muscle because we're so used to looking at ourselves from the outside yeah. especially um, in a romantic setting there's so much pressure on attraction to be like a outward thing right um so like we can objectify ourselves a hundred percent and but there comes a point where you, it's not sustainable no. so little little steps in just actually landing in in, in your your feeling rather than how you look and mm. and stretching those those places more and more okay this one's kind of more of a like a you think but i kind of feel like i can answer it mm -hmm. would you say dating now is different than in your generation i think you know the, the 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 human emotions haven't changed probably from caveman yeah so you know it's still attachment it's still everything that 
I think you guys are feeling, mm. we, we felt and still feeling, but I do think that there are also big differences. The main one would be probably the, I, you know, that, that the kind of too much choice mm. where uh, for us, I think the, the, the pool of choice was more limited mm. um, and that had its uh, advantages and disadvantages, but I think you were, um, less in this kind of feeling of being discarded too easily or mm. being too easy to discard. Mm. The other thing is that it's less and less um, accessible for people to actually interact in everyday life and for that to be acceptable as a way to uh, generate connection. So, uh, you know, like a pickup or, or, or you know, just a sweet interaction and for that to lead to a phone number and for that to lead to a date, it feels like today is more awkward. People are, 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 are kind of more shield to mm -hmm. that, less walking around open in the world. Mm -hmm. So I guess dating today has this extra layer where you need to adjust your vision from a kind of, um, online version of the person so the projection of their image and the projection of what you've projected on them who they are into then meeting in real life and how does it actually feel to be with yeah. that person or i think for us it you know you start with that feeling it's less about how people looked it's more about how they made you feel completely uh, so i think there was more of a consistency there where I think in dating today, it's like you're you're almost dating two people. You're dating the version of the person, and then you're dirty, dating the real life person. So and, crazy. Yeah, it's really wild talking about it to my friends as well, and being like, with dating apps and social media, it's like if you meet someone that you're interested in, most of the time you will try to find their socials and like get a vibe of them through that, which is this whole like not even them but just how they present themselves right. and like you know there's all this, the jokes with girls being like my dream guy doesn't even like like he has an instagram but he doesn't use it like everyone has <laughs> their like preferences of, of like how not only the person is but how they showcase it's like you, you, you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't it's so weird yeah. and and it is that thing with um dating apps where it is so easy to just like only go off you know initial like attraction and it is so crazy again like talking to my friends and being like so many of these guys on these dating apps maybe if we met in real life you know it's so much about how they smell and how they make you feel and the little like jokes they put in that you just can't get from a photo like somebody could be like a really attractive guy even but they just like don't have good photos of themselves or it's like what you're meeting is what they think is attractive, attractive. about them <laughs> which is often not I necessarily what you'd find attractive i have genuinely like every time i've been on a dating app i just look at these like accounts and i'm like i just wish i could help all of these guys that's and actually a good profession literally and, like you could be like a, i'm a, like i like the fact that you counselor. thought this photo was going to get you a a date a date is just <laughs> mind baffling to me how to handle bad communication in early dating stages yeah that's a really really good question and what's interesting like in my clinic i can see uh, as opposed to 10 years ago, couples coming in younger and younger yeah. and Earl like in their, in their early stages. And I admire that so much because yeah. it's actually the same patterns of communication that then you see a couple 30 years down the track and it's the same thing. And mm -hmm. if you know, they just have the tools beforehand because unfortunately most of us don't necessarily have really good role models yeah. uh, for how communication uh, can happen. What I really can say very, very simplistically um, is that the most important thing is to try and understand what it is you're feeling and what it is you, you need. Mm. Uh, rather than attacking someone else. So often we know so well what the other person's doing wrong and how they need to do it 
differently but unfortunately doesn't actually help it's mm -hmm. really when we can actually understand oh this is what i'm doing i become all defensive mm -hmm. rather than taking responsibility um, maybe if i do that the whole dynamic can de-escalate and and really learning how to have difficult conversations and yeah. areas of conflict because we don't agree on everything but we can learn how to communicate better mm. how to really listen to the other person and um, and i think what's the reason this question is such a good question is because what couples see um, throughout the years is that the content changes but the dance remains mm -hmm. the same mm -hmm. so if you learn how to do the dance differently that um, can be very very uh, impactful and helpful for a relationship so yeah um, good question how to deal with the doubt about finding the one i've never been in a relationship at 19. firstly you're young mm -hmm. <laughs> i know social media and culture can tell you that uh, you're not and you may feel also very ready and it's that ripeness that's mm. starting to speak uh, the place of the yearning with its beauty and it's um, like otherworldly almost uh, sensation can also feel very vulnerable and scary mm. and definitely your 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 interacting with the unknown we don't know what's the next page in in the story uh of of you know of the book of your life um so i think it's befriending that because that's actually a muscle that we need to befriend um as we mature as grown people uh it will never go away yeah. that tension um so you know can you make friends with that place can you find a place of of trust you belong in this world and there are people that belong to you uh, again you know it has a bit of a more spiritual perspective also i'm a big believing in calling it in you mm. know it's like it's telling kind of your 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 subconscious or your higher self or existence mm. you know i i'm ready it's so easy to compare your path to other people and that yearning to meet someone is something i'm so familiar <laughs> with <laughs> and something a lot of my friends and me talk about a lot is mm. that like wanting to find that person i think like a bit over a month ago i remember having a conversation with one of my girlfriends about it and i was like oh, i just missed that person and she just had the best like answers of just being like you just have to trust like you know this person's coming how special is it to be in this point in your life where you haven't even met them yet mm. and you just get to like work on yourself and like be excited and get yourself ready so that when they come you're just like such an incredible version of yourself that has worked so deeply on who she is that same friend as well told me that like a few days before we had that conversation she had written a whole letter to her future partner like literally just detailing like how he made her feel and like like writing him a love letter obviously she hasn't met this man yet she doesn't know who he is but i think it's just so something beautiful when you lean into the yearning and being like i know you're coming and how special that i haven't met you yet and one day you'll be there and it's gonna be so beautiful and like manifesting that some of my friends literally have like pinterest boards where they just like add photos of like couples that make them feel like oh i want that and writing lists about things they want and like just like getting clear and just having fun with it and yeah like, oh my god it's coming how exciting yeah like, and also to bring it down to real life mm -hmm. and you know to become available mm -hmm. uh, there's something in the signals and i guess that also goes back to what's different dating you know today mm -hmm. and, and and back in the day and i think it's really we're becoming less reliant on these interactions Inter yeah. and how meaningful they are how meaningful it is to actually smile to someone to mm -hmm. actually express availability to express interest managing in-law relationships and family dynamics i i don't have too much to say because it's really so specific context yeah. is so specific yeah. and i think um you know when we talk about in-laws and we talk about the fa family system 
it's also often very there's an intersectionality with culture mm -hmm. different cultures and it can be um, a, the culture of the family but it can be also the culture within the family how the the family actually operates mm -hmm. um, I guess there is that tension between the us and the system around us and mm -hmm. how you guys as a couple create this usness so really uh, create this uh, sense of we are both actively protecting the us mm. and we're allowing people that are also um, protecting us and 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 not uh, jeopardizing or compromising that sense of uh, of of usness um, so you know this this comes with with boundaries it comes with deep conversations um, it can be challenging but I think once we're feeling more secure in in the sense of uh, the togetherness often we're we're more equipped to deal with people that are outside of the us and and sometimes uh, it's a bit of a shift you know if it, all of a sudden uh, the mother-in-law um, you know, she, she's somehow outside of this bubble now. Mm. Uh, there's a different bubble where mm. she maybe was used to be the primary relationship for, for her child. So these adjustments, so creating a safe, uh, secure attachment for everyone involved. It's not always possible. Mm. It's a um, tricky one. It's, it's a, a tricky, tricky one, one, but definitely uh, important. Last question. <laughs> Is it impossible for some women to orgasm with penetration? A hundred percent, yes. Is um, seventy percent of women uh, biologically um, do not climax only through intercourse. So, um, and that is a fact, and that is a fact. So, mm -hmm. uh, a great book is Come As You Are by Emily Nagoski. Mm -hmm. I think, um, that really science based, but it's very readable and easy to digest. And I, I think it gives really, really good uh, information um, for all of us. And that's it, guys. Thanks, Mama, for being on the channel. Thank you for having me. Thank mm. you for all the love. I really, really don't take that for granted. We love you. Oh. Don't we love Mama on the channel and in real life? Aww. Always. Thank you. Thank you guys for your questions. Again, sorry if we didn't get to yours. Um, hopefully we can do more videos like this. If you have video ideas you want us to do, topics, let us know. Mm. We always love to see your comments. Anything else we want to add? Follow me on Instagram. I'm, I, I'm nothing on Instagram at the moment. Follow mom on Instagram. <laughs> you can follow, maybe that will give you an incentive. <laughs> um, and yeah, love you.